Today's episode is brought to you by Stream by AlphaSense, an expert interview transcript library that integrates AI-generated call summaries and NLP search technology so their clients can quickly pinpoint the most critical insights. Start your free trial at www.streamrg.co backslash PMC. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G dot co slash PMC. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. Thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. Do me a quick favor. If you like what you hear at Planet Microcap, please take two seconds to give us five stars on Spotify or Apple. This helps with the search engine so that more folks can also discover and engage with all things microcap stocks. Next up, the Planet Microcap Showcase Vegas is happening April 30th through May 2nd, 2024 at the Paris Hotel and Casino. Save that date. We are working our tails off behind the scenes to put together the best program we can. The website is now live. And if you'd like to register to participate, please visit planetmicrocapshowcase.com. See you in Vegas. Now, my guest on the show today is Matthew Martin, Portfolio Manager at Reef Malt Investments and editor of the Stocks and Stones newsletter now on Substack. Recently, Canadian microcap buyouts have been gaining focus. As Matthew points out in our conversation, there's been 10 non-resource Canadian microcap transactions in 2023. While that may not seem that much, the frequency they've been happening of late has us microcap warriors taking note. I invited on my friend and colleague, Matthew Martin, to chat with me about what is going on here and whether we think M&A will continue to move at this fast rate with the fear that sentiment is or may change for the better. Thank you again for tuning into the Planet Microcap podcast, and please enjoy my interview with Matthew Martin. Matthew, thank you for joining me. How are you doing? Como se va? Hey, Bobby, I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Uh, ça va très bien. Ça va très bien. Did I do that right? Como se va? I think I combined my Spanish with, the, with like my slight French. Yeah, no, it was good. It was good. Oh, good. All right. I... Anyways, the, look, the main reason I, I wanted to have you on here today is, listen, there's been a bit of m and right? A little, little, uh, little bit of m and in the Canadian microcaps here in the last, uh, well, I'd say I, I'll generalize and just say all of 2023, but it's definitely of note uh, compared to maybe years past. But let I figured let's jump right in, you know, um, first things first. What's going on? You know, why are we seeing so many, you know, 70% of recent buyouts uh, from private equity, just buyouts in general? What, what's going on? Why is this happening? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think what's what we need to pay attention to is that there's been an acceleration in the the number of many transactions recently. I, I feel like in the last few weeks, there was, uh, you know, one or two per week. Uh, we've seen. Uh, I compiled a list. There, there's been about 10, 10 M&A transactions in the last few months, and I think. Th- I mean, there are a few reasons, but uh, as as I'm sure you know, the the Canadian microcap space has been in a pretty nasty bear market over the last two and a half years. So it peaked in March 2021 and has been on a downtrend since. If you look at the TSX Venture Index, it's down about 50%. From its peak, and so right now, uh, I mean, there are lots of uh, undervalued companies in the space. Um, I think a lot of the higher quality names have been uh, have been um, basically, you know, the, the baby thrown out with the bad the bad water, uh, and they've been uh, punished as severely as the maybe lesser quality names. So um, now I think we're seeing. A, private equity coming into the space and 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 taking advantage of those uh, those opportunities 
I mean, it's pretty interesting. Like, I mean, you know, you sent me the the list of, the, of 10 that are the buyouts, you know, HS GovTech, IOU Financial, BBTV Holdings, Spark Power Group, Q4, Playmaker, OpSense, H2O Innovation, Neighborly Pharmacy, Logistec, Logistec. You know, these are names like, I, I mean, I'm decently familiar with, not, not some of the larger ones, but I mean, H2O Innovation, OpSense, Playmaker. I mean, Q4, that was one that came out of left field. It's just, it's seeming like they came out of left field when like, if anybody was kind of paying attention and looking at Canadian microcaps, you'd be like, all right, something may could be happening here relatively soon. Just also when you're looking at volumes or trading volumes, it's just, there's been no liquidity whatsoever. So it, the kind of the recipe for this kind of environment was right there for the taking. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, I mean, the, the these stocks. I mean, for the most part, they 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 were in a pretty severe decline. Uh, if I mean, you mentioned Q4, uh, which I don't own, by the way, uh, is uh, I mean, it 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 IPO that a way 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 higher price than uh, what it got uh, acquired at. So uh, I think it's. It's uh you know it's the scenario for most of these holdings um and um yeah i mean uh, it's been it's, uh, it's been interesting to to follow yeah no it's interesting cuz i'm part of um, i i think we should probably say or may, maybe when we do the next pod is like you know, you put the premium amount and that's the premium for what it, you know, from the day of the transaction right so if you took it back to from when it ipo or from maybe at, at its peaks I mean, I, I would argue that some of the, you know, you just mentioned Q4, for example, like they're all, they were all still trading at, you know, well below where they, where they were even probably where they IPO'd at, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, some of the, so, some of the names in the list also, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I tried to uh, find out, you know, maybe what, what, what was the main reason for the acquisition? Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, uh, it's a great strategic fit for a strategic acquirer, or maybe it's a, it's a good fit for private equity because um, the, the company has lots of recurring predictable cash flows. And some other times it's just, you know, some of these companies were in financial difficulties and they had uh, a lot of debt and uh, weren't profitable and had to sell at a distressed price. And so, Especially these uh, the, these types of uh, acquisitions were were done at uh, probably a significant loss for most shareholders, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, how, what what was your impression of the valuation metrics that some of these uh, some of these transactions were taken out of or done at? Excuse me. Yeah. Well, w- what I've been uh, noticing is. Uh, I, you can kind of uh, see it in three buckets. So there, there were, like I said, the the ones that were in financial difficulty. So now, in in that bucket, you're seeing really d- depressed valuations. Uh, you know, around one times or less uh, revenue, or there, there there was one at six times EBITDA. Um, then the the second bucket would be uh, maybe on the large uh, on the larger side companies that are. You know, profitable, cash flow positive. Uh, those sold in the twelve to nineteen uh, times EBITDA multiple range, and, and then you have the the SaaS companies, the the software companies uh, with uh, you know annual recurring revenues, and those uh, sold in the three to three and a half times uh, revenue multiple, which is kind of interesting because if you look at the the SaaS uh, space in Canada, which is uh, a space I, I know well and I invest a lot in that space. You know, our portfolio with the Rivmont Market Cap Fund is invested heavily in, in uh, Canadian technology stocks. And what I'm seeing in my portfolio and on my watch list, uh, there are a lot of companies trading at, you know, two times or less uh, EV to uh, annual recurring revenue. So, uh seeing those acquisitions at over three times is uh is pretty encouraging uh, and it, it kind of puts a floor on, on valuations i i think that's why that's one of the reasons why we saw a pretty significant rebound in in in, in the market in november uh because you know when you get all this private equity money coming and buying up at, at these kinds of multiples i mean like who's gonna sell in the market at 
one and a half times revenue uh, when you know that the company could be acquired for twice this price. So I think it kind of put a, a, a floor on, on valuations. You know, it's interesting too that <clears throat> when you're seeing here that private equity coming in and, you know, not only doing the transactions that it has so far in uh, Canadian microcaps, um, but I mean, the fact that there is all this money on the sideline, but it also kind of signals to you, it's like, all right, they're almost going back to fundamentals in a little bit where they're like, all right, why not go to the public markets and see what companies are actually generating revenues? You know, no more waiting for some of these tech companies that don't even have a real business model yet, you know, and and funding that growth. Like, why not just get one of these and put them into our fold, cut costs and, every, you know, cut all cut out all the public public market costs. You know, I'm I'm not I don't know off the top of my head, you know, how many of these companies are keeping the management teams on to then run those businesses and then just doing it like that. But be curious if that's maybe some of the mindset that um some of these private equity firms are thinking right now. Yeah, I would I would think so. Uh I mean I'm uh I'm not in their boardrooms. I, I don't know their their exact uh, rationale, but uh yeah, I I think it 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 makes sense. Uh, it's it's part of the explanation, and the one a few other things I would highlight is that um, I mean, right now there's a, a lot of dry powder in the private equity space. Uh, so the, the the amount of uh, of deals uh, in I mean in dollar value, the amount of deals that have happened this year has been uh, pretty low. I mean, relatively to the the, the the past uh, trend, it's been uh, a, a pretty big decline compared to the last few years, and so there's a lot of money on the sidelines looking for deals. and And what's happening is that you don't see a lot of mega deals right now. I think it's because of the macro environment that's been a little uh, a little bit more challenging, and also maybe higher interest rates, which makes it more challenging to finance those deals. And so. I think private equity now is looking to deploy capital into smaller deals. And then in the smaller uh, realm, you have publics and private. Um, and what I heard uh, from uh, private equity investors is that right now, the the small private companies, um, they, they are kind of anchored to the the valuations that they have seen in the last couple of years, which were much higher. And so, I mean, they, they're private and they don't have any, uh, they're not in a hurry to sell, you know. So so they're kind of anchored on those higher valuations and private equity is looking to pay way lower prices. And so no deals happening because of uh, disconnect in valuation expectations. And so what's left is the public market. And, and then you have, you know, Canadian market, which is, uh, very attractive valuations are low. Uh, lots of people are looking for liquidity, and you also have the favorable exchange rate, uh, the USD to Canadian dollar ex exchange rate, which is uh, good for U.S. private equity firms to come to Canada to buy those assets. So I think that's kind of the perfect storm why private equity is looking at the at, at this space right now. Absolutely. That, I think that was a really good explanation right there. You know, in looking at these 10 transactions that, you know, happened, which one was the most surprising to you when you saw the news cross the wire? Um, well, actually, uh, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say there was one that I was shocked about, but uh, uh, I think H HS GovTech yeah, specifically, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't own it. I've owned it in the past. Uh, I I was kind of surprised because the, I mean it's 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 fairly small, uh, way smaller than the other deals that have happened, and uh, I mean they were they it's it felt like they were on the cusp of significant revenue growth. Uh, I think the challenge for them was that they 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 were not profitable, and I I feel like. Maybe they had some challenges uh, raising raising capital to to stay afloat. So perhaps that that was the main uh, reason for selling to private equity at this point. Otherwise, I I I think they would have probably preferred to, you know, 
see their see their growth in the execute on their growth in the coming years and, and hopefully sell at a better valuation down the road. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I remember I uh yeah, HS they they presented in Vegas a couple times actually. Um so yeah. That, yeah. And maybe one other one, uh, I mean, play, Playmaker, which yeah. I don't own as well. Uh, it, it it actually came on my radar a few weeks before the acquisition. Uh, I have a, a, a friend and an investor in our fund who uh, who um, had a business in a, in a kind of a similar business in the same space, and he he, he looked at Playmaker. He told me it it looked really interesting. Their business model was, uh, according to him, was uh, very solid, and so he recommended I look at the stock. And uh, my analyst and I started doing research. Uh, we we also thought it was a pretty good opportunity. We booked a meeting with management, and in between the time we we kind of put the research on all waiting for the meeting. They got acquired, so uh, it was kind of unfortunate that we weren't able to complete our research before uh, it was gone. Dude, you got to work faster, man. Come on, yeah, man. yeah, That's I know. Awesome. Come on, man. <laughs> No rest, dude. Come on. Uh, Q4 was a shocker for me in some respects. Um, I didn't. I didn't. I. I had no indication that there was. They were. You know, they were going to be on the block. But again, I mean, you. Sh- we shouldn't be shocked by any of these, right? Especially in these times. Like, if you can get, you know, if you can get a valuation that you're comfortable with, and you're uh, more. More importantly, your shareholders are, or the majority of shareholders are comfortable with. You know, hey, what's the, the what's the Godfather line, right? Uh, make me an offer I can't refuse. You know, and um, it seems like that's happened quite often here. You know, yeah. or at least more often than it has in the past. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you know, another um, um, uh, piece of content that you sent to me was this. Uh, and I thought it was really good, actually. Is um, from Atrium Research. Uh, I'm no affiliation. I, I haven't met them, or I don't know them very well. But they put out um, a piece titled "Finding the Next Takeout in Canadian Small Caps," and they they did a pretty good job of you know what uh, also some similarities amongst the ones that had been taken out. Uh, this was published on November seventh, so they 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 didn't include one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they didn't include a, three of the transactions that that we have just discussed, but um, they do go into you know what are some of the the I guess the characteristics to find the next one amongst the Canadian small uh, microcap space. Um, so I mean, do we want to go through a few of them? I think they they have about six um six characteristics here you know i mean what do you think what do you think i mean do, are they pretty spot on with some of these six maybe I'll, I'll read them out real quick and then i'll get your response so um poor stock performance cheap uh that's one two cheap versus u.s and international peers three profitable four solid growth and tailwinds five market cap over 100 million and then six is private equity friendly uh so those are that's that's the common characteristics of some of the ones that were done and that you know might be on the radar or or maybe some that might be on the radar that have some of those characters. So what do you think about there? Are they missing anything or what do you think? well I, I I think they're fairly spot on. I mean uh I mean poor stock performance is uh, pretty much a given. Uh everything's down in uh, or pretty much everything. Uh chief versus in, international peers. Uh I think that's also generally true. Or at least, you know, small caps being cheaper than lar- larger caps is 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 pretty true across the board. Uh, and then, <clears throat> well, I mean, basically, they, they they kind of look at the characteristics of the M&A transactions that have already happened to figure out, you know, what buyers might be looking for. And I think, you know, profitable, solid growth in tailwinds makes a lot of sense. Uh, like H2O Innovation, for example, which was one of the recent transactions, uh, which we don't own, um, was in the the water infrastructure space. And uh, I mean, water scarcity is a, is a big issue. I'm sure you, you know about it uh, being in California. So uh, <clears throat> H2O being in that space is, uh, I mean, you, you kind of know they have a, a strong tailwinds for the next, you know, probably decades. Uh, so they got bought out by a, an infrastructure uh, private equity firm. Um, 
And I think that makes a lot of sense. And and then um, in terms of size, uh, I mean, they say over 100 million market cap, which is generally true. I mean, the, I think seven out of the 10 uh, recent transactions were over 100 million. There were a few small, smaller ones. Um, and then uh, private equity friendly, I think makes a lot of sense too. I mean, you're, I mean, especially the, the kind of the, the SaaS companies with, Lots of recurring revenues, high retention rates, predictable cash flows. I think that's that that's probably a model that private equity likes a lot. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, what what I what I I I look out for in the for for the next ones uh, would be maybe more on the strategic side, like which companies will sell to strategics, uh, like. I'll just highlight uh, one other transaction that happened uh, up since uh, it's a medical device company. We don't own it. Um, and they uh, they have in, uh, intellectual property protection on their products. And they sold for close to seven times revenue to a strategic uh, because the strategic is a larger medical device company. They have all the sales channels in place. They can probably take those products put them in, in their existing sales channels and really increase the value of the company uh, that they just bought pretty quickly. Um, so I'm looking forward to maybe seeing a few of those uh, more strategic moves going forward. I think uh, if, if I had to make a prediction, uh, I think we'll see more of those as well, uh, which hasn't happened so far uh, very much. For sure. you know. And then I'm also looking at the list of you know what they on on their report of potential takeouts watch list and it's it's based on um they put it together quantitatively that meet the criteria that they outlined above and it's actually a really good chart that shows based on market cap price versus their high um the sales growth ebitda margin ev to ebitda and i mean you know like i mean these are all names that Anybody who follows, you know, the small micro cap, nano cap space in Canada have probably owned one, maybe more than one of these at any given point in their career, um, like without a doubt. Um, and looking at some of these names for sure. Um, but I mean, I'd be curious that if there is a resurgence in, I guess, um, and, and it feels like sentiment is somewhat turning. I'm being cautiously optimistic when I say that in terms of how people are starting to think about, you know, small micro caps, um, just, you know, how much more beaten down could we possibly get? Um, especially when you look at, you know, where some of these stocks are trading versus their high. I mean, you know, 70 down 73%, down 76%, 81%. But I mean, could private equity start to dry up or do you think we might see, you um, I guess the rate in which some of these transactions happen faster in maybe the next couple months here with the fear that sentiment might turn. Uh it's uh it's a it's a pretty good question. Uh it's kind of, you know, it's kind of hard to predict. Uh I mean sentiment can shift pretty quickly, especially I think in microcaps. Uh uh you know the the market went down pretty significantly over the last couple of years, and for the most part, I think it was on you know lower liquidity uh, than than usual, uh, and so that works both ways. You know it can go up uh, as fast as it went down on low liquidity as well. So I I mean if if some stocks start to to re rate because sentiment turns. Maybe we see some fear of missing out from private equity. I, I, I honestly I don't like I, I don't have a lot of experience with. I, I, I've never I've never worked in private equity or anything like that, so I, I I'm not sure how they operate. But uh, I mean, either way, something has to give. You know, either private equity will keep acquiring or the mark like investors will wake up and. and and stocks will re-rate to the upside and, and will return to a more normal valuation level. Uh, it, it's going to be one, 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 of, one or one the or the other. You know? yeah. yeah. I mean, but, and it, so this must be like, I mean, this is must, you would think then this is the best time ever to be a small microcap investor, especially if you're looking at 
you know, Canadian small micro caps right now, because all right. Okay. There, that's your, those are the two things that, you know, is your main thesis of like, all right, something's got to give on, you know, some of these stocks re-rating to the upside because how much more beaten down could these, you know, businesses get and, oh, or they just get taken out, you know? So, okay. If my entry point is now, you know, the average premium of the recent 10 takeouts has been what, uh, I mean, in the, in, in the report here, it's 73%, but that was for the seven transactions. So I think that number is relative. <laughs> Yeah, it's about 70%. About 70%. So your average return is 70% if you, you know, you know, bought a basket of some of these, right? Um, how is this not the best time ever to be, you know, even, not just individual, but on the institutional side too? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, I've been telling uh, everybody who wants to hear it that uh, this is the best time to invest in, in, micro, in Canadian microcaps. I mean... Uh, like personally, I've been investing uh, since 2014, and also so almost 10 years, and it's the best environment I've ever seen. Like it's not even close. So uh, I I think it's it's it really is a generational uh, well creating opportunity. Uh, but at the same time, you know, people want to be contrarian and want to uh, be greedy when others are fearful. But when it really happens, it's, it's really tough to pull the trigger. And I think right now, you know, the sentiment is, uh, except for last month, you know, the, the sentiment has been really negative uh, towards small caps. And you're seeing that, that big outperformance of large cap for, for many, many years. And so nobody wants to touch the asset class and um it's it, it's i think it's really hard for most people to decide to invest in this asset class right now even though valuations are cheap because who knows if they if they will go lower or it will stay flat for for a very long time but you know i i, I kind of feel like this is starting to change uh i wrote a, a, a post recently called rebound which basically talks about uh, what happened in 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 november and like you said, you have private equity buying up these assets for nice premiums or otherwise, you know, I mean, the, the fundamentals are still strong. I mean, these companies keep growing, uh, keep posting good results. Fundamentals are improving and you're kind of seeing now a return of, of liquidity in the space. Uh, I've been seeing stocks uh, moving uh much more than any time in the last two years on good earnings or good news. Um, you know, transaction volume seems to be picking up as well. And uh, anecdotally, I, I'm hearing that uh, institutional money is, uh, is, is looking at the space again and trying to, to uh, re-enter the space. I mean, look, it's encouraging also, you know, and you may mention in that same article, Rebound, um, did you, you just put that out today didn't, or yesterday. Something. Uh yeah, this week. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're recording this on uh Friday, December 1st, 2023, for just for reference. Um, but in the second point that you made in that article about, you know, companies that are showing fundamental progress are getting rewarded. I think everybody collectively hears that is like, oh, finally. Oh. Yeah, yeah. What a what a what a, what a concept, you know, uh stocks going up all, for fundamental reasons because you know, oh my goodness, you know, just revenues going up, profitable, and all that. And you you gave uh, a couple examples here, um, uh, Vital Hub and Think uh, Thinkific Labs and and Kraken Robotics. Full disclosure, not a shareholder in any of those, um, but that's interesting, you know, and especially considering Q3 is always a crap quarter, right? Like uh, traditionally. Is, a, is, you know, a crap quarter, you know, amongst a large percentage of companies that do report, you know, uh, on a on a, a calendar year. Um, so, you know. Yeah, well, I, I heard you say that on a, on a recent uh, podcast episode. And um, actually, I, I was kind of surprised that you would say that because that's not been my experience, at least not this year. Um, um, I mean, I like every, every company that that was reporting um uh, maybe you know the, the 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 TSX listed companies that 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 report by the middle of November I mean the earnings were really really strong I was I was 
I was getting excited, you know, fundamentals were, were in good shape. And then towards the end of the month, you get all the TS6 uh, venture listed companies reporting on the last day of the month. And then that was all crap. But uh, otherwise, uh, no, I, I think it was a pretty good quarter uh, overall. Oh, yeah. No, look, I, I'm not I'm not trying to say every Q3 for every company is terrible. OK, you know, it's just traditionally, you know, that, you know, they report the Q3 and you're like, all right, let me just kind of bury this one. And, you know, now we're getting ready. We'll gear up for the full year, you know, Q4 results and everyone, you know, we'll see how great we are. You know, that that's just traditionally how it's been from from my experience, you know. Yeah. Again, yeah. That's not to say that some, you know, you have some outliers that, you know, were, you know, in that year, it's been great, you know, versus uh, what it's traditionally been. But yeah. I mean, I mean, is there anything that we're missing in terms of some of this, this trend that's going on in, you know, just in, in this uptick in transactions, this uptick in companies that are reporting, you know, quality fundamentals starting to, you know, volumes are increasing institutional money now coming down the mark, the market cap spectrum, you know, is there anything else that we're missing in terms of this trend that's going on that we hope will then start to seep into us micro and nano cap <laughs> markets as well? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, maybe one, one other thing I would highlight is that, um, you know, over the last couple of years, um, all the, Earnings press releases were mentioning, you know, inflation, supply chain uh, disruptions. Uh, there were a lot of external factors um, that were hurting the performance of many companies. And on the flip side, you also had some big COVID beneficiaries uh, that, uh, you know, COVID inflated their their results for a couple of years, and it it kind of created a weird environment where you didn't really know. Is the company poorly executing or are they really just affected by something that's out of their control or are they really growing as fast as they are or is it just because of uh, external forces that that is driving their business temporarily and i think q3 were i at least for me uh looking at the these earnings releases i think was kind of the turning point where now you're really seeing more clearly uh companies, uh, you, you know, the, the inflation and supply chain disruptions uh, issues are kind of in the review mirror now. And so you're really seeing the true execution of the business. And I think, you know, companies that have executed well have been rewarded because I think people see that it's it's true fundamental performance. And then you're also seeing companies that were COVID beneficiaries now, things are kind of falling apart. Uh, there has been, I, I, now I'm seeing like uh, a lot of companies mentioning overstocking issues. Uh, so in, in their, in their distribution channels, uh, lots of overstocks that gets to, uh, the, it needs to be worked through. And so, uh, they're seeing a big slowdown in sales. Uh, it's been ongoing for a few quarters now. Uh, so, you know. Uh, we'll we'll see how that evolves, but uh, now now we're seeing a clear picture. I think that might have been the best point you made in this whole podcast today, is because that's something I've been thinking about a lot too. And I think I said it at the beginning of 2023, or like in one of those podcasts where I was saying, okay, at some point the rubber's got to meet the road. Like you can't make these excuses about supply chain anymore. Can't make these excuses about inflation. Like you know, these are all. Every, there's always going to be an excuse, you know, at the end of the day, like execute, you know, yeah, no, no exactly. you know, so I think that's actually, it's really important that you brought that up to, you know, that this was kind of that quarter or just even in the last couple quarters, this was that time where you're going to start to see which ones are, you know, the higher quality ones rising above, you know, not making excuses or just executing, or, you know, maybe they didn't execute as well, but they're even just saying like, we're nose to the grindstone. That's all we're focused on. Like we're not even, you know, Bob, I don't even want to talk to you right now because we're just focused on the business, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, that's, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's, that's a, kind of a good way to wrap it. I mean, like I said, anything else or should, or, you know, in your estimation, you know, the kind of, like I said, we're beginning of December here, we're going into 2024. It's in a month. I can't believe this year has gone by so quickly. Is there anything in ahead to 2024? Do you, if, I mean, I'm not trying to, you don't have to make any predictions or anything like that, but do you have any expectations on 
let's say increases in transactions or do you think sentiment is starting to change? You know, what, what, what's, where do you, where do you think the, the ball's moving? Yeah. Well, I, I, th- I mean, if you look at the, the past, this past month in November, I think the sentiment has changed. Uh, will it keep up on that, that momentum? I don't, I, I don't know. I can predict the future. I, I sure hope so. Um, but, um, other than that, I, you know, how I'm approaching the market right now, um, from what I've seen recently, um, you know, if if you make the the hypothesis that institutional money is coming down into small caps and perhaps private equity keeps buying uh, small caps, uh, I think the 100 million to 300 million market cap range is the place to hunt right now because. These are typically a little bit more liquid than the the really you know the small ones, the nano caps, and and so I think that's where institutional money will make its move first. Uh, and it, it, you know when I mentioned that in in November the the companies got rewarded for uh, putting out good results or good news, I'm talking mostly about over a hundred million market cap companies, um, and and they moved on big volume. Uh, so that tells me that institutional money is coming and and buying up these names, and I think that's gonna continue. There are still several, in my opinion, high quality uh, micro caps in 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 this market cap range that haven't made their move yet. So I think we're gonna see more of that, and then when these most of these names have uh, made their move and kind of re-rated to to uh, better valuations i think capital will keep moving down market and then you know we'll see the the 50 million market cap and the 30 million market cap companies starting to move as well um so so that that's how i would approach the market uh, going into 2024 I think that's a perfect place to end it. Matthew, where can our audience go and subscribe to your new newsletter, Stocks and Stones, and uh, get in contact with you? Follow you on social media the whole bit. Yeah, so uh, the Substack newsletter is called Stocks and Stones. It's stocksandstones.substack.com. Uh, you can also follow me on uh, X or Twitter at uh, stocks underscore stones. On LinkedIn, it's just my name. And uh, you can also check out the fund that I manage, the Rivmont Microcap Fund at R-I-V-E-M-O-N-T dot C-A. Very cool. I mean, I guess we got to pour one out for eSpace Microcaps. I mean, you know, that's how I got to know you and Philippe. Uh, you know, it, it had a good run and now it's Stocks and Stones, right? Is that the, that's the, that's the idea? Yeah, yeah, that's the that's unfortunately the pretty much the end of eSpace microcaps. I I mean, eSpace was more focused on the do-it-yourself investor and yeah. uh, more like how to invest in individual companies. Stocks and stones. My goal is more uh, to share content on the asset class more more broadly and and get people interested into the space. Very cool. Well, we'll keep sharing whatever you got up there. So keep it going. And dude, always appreciate it, man. Good luck. Stay safe. I look forward to our next update. All right. Thanks, Bobby. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast podcast.